If you got your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to look at, (coughs) excuse me, the first three verses. And once I get this coffee in me, we'll look at them real fast. But what I want to talk about today in this informal, formal setting is I'm going to talk about the motivation to run with endurance. So faith is an extremely important part of the Christian life. In fact, it is one of the characteristics that sets us apart from unbelievers. So if you've ever been around an unbeliever, you know that their response to life is overall very negative. Eat, drink, be merry, because tomorrow we Die. Let's party it up today because we're not guaranteed to be able to party it up tomorrow. They have a very negative outlook on life. And when you look at their ideology of we are nothing that eventually become nothing, then what is the point of life? There's no sanctity of life. There, there's no value in life. There's just being. Well, our response to life as Christians is a tad bit more optimistic. And our response is that we persevere through the pains of this life and then our reward comes at the end. So our reward is so great, it is immensely worth the pain that we deal with here. So chapter 11, the chapter before chapter 12, because 11 comes before 12, of Hebrews, it gives us a long list of believers who persevered in their faith. As James says, they proved their faith by their works. A few examples from from 11. Abraham, he left his home when he was called. Abel, he offered the better sacrifice. Enoch was just translated to heaven Noah, he was saved from worldwide destruction. Sarah was given a child in her old age. Y'all be nice to me. I might pray that down on some of y'all. And there are many, many more. in just side-eyed me, man. They, uh, there's many more in Hebrews 11, but they all have something in common. They all died without seeing the promise. It says it right there in chapter 11. See, we get the benefit of we get to look back on God's completed word and read about it in God's completed book. We get this awesome benefit that they didn't. So in comparison to those champions of the faith, faith should be a lot easier for us today, right? It's not. In the New Testament, there's a lot of metaphors that describe the Christian life. It says our lives are like slaves that serve a good master. Our relationship to God is like that of sons. Our tongues are like the rudders of a ship, James says in his book. Uh, But a number of metaphors in the New Testament use sports analogies. Everybody knows that. Sports have been popular all throughout history up to today. The Olympics just finished. We had a good time watching it. Sports are a timeless analogy. So here in Hebrews 12, we have the analogy of running. If you've ever watched the Olympics or watched it these past few weeks, you know that you cannot jump off the couch and immediately run a marathon. You're not going to roll out of bed and decide, I'm doing the Ironman. It takes training. It takes dedication. And if you want to get to an Olympic level, it takes a life of devotion to the sport. You're seeing people that devote their lives to these sports. So in verse 1, it shows that we have a race set before us. In fact, let's go ahead and read verse number 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, And let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. Verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter, I think the King James says finisher, of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So verse 1 shows us we have this race that sets before us. <clears throat> if we are unprepared, this race will destroy us. If, if we were to get a wild hair and decide we're going to head down to Planet Fitness and we are going to get on the stair climber, man, and we're going to set that thing to where we're doing 120 flights of stairs every minute, we're going to die. We are going to literally die. We're going to fall off that thing and break our necks. But if we train ourselves, if we start at 10 flights, if we go up to 12, 14, 30, and march it up to that, we will endure. Without endurance, we can't finish the race. That's the biggest focus. That's the biggest focus. Whenever I played tennis, I played tennis a little in uh, high school and college, and the biggest thing they would say is consistency. You don't have to be the best player. You just have to be the most consistent. When you're running, they say the biggest thing with running is endurance. I don't know. I hated running. Tennis, you should have to run little spurts, and then you're done, and you get one really buff arm. So the fact is is that in verse 11, we have this great cloud of witnesses. Let us learn from their examples and do like them. We can persevere to the end. So how do we do that? So what I want to do is I want to look at biblical commands that are listed here in the first three verses of Hebrews and then tie that to our motivation on how to do it. We may make it through all of them. We may not. I'm not going to try to keep you super late. First, we have to set aside our hindering weights. Verse number one speaks of two hindrances to the Christian as they attempt to run the spiritual race. The first one is their encumbrance. I'm not, is that, is that what it says in the King James? Weight. Weight. Yeah. That's perfect. The Greek word there literally means a bulk or a mass. Something heavy that is on you. So let me ask you this. How many athletes are competing with a bulk on their shoulders? I'm not talking about weightlifters, Terry. <laughs> when training, athletes will use weights to increase resistance to train their body to handle stress better. But we're not talking about training right here. We're talking about the show. The cameras are rolling. We're in the race. During the actual race, it would be foolish to carry weights on you if you're actually trying to finish it. These are represented by anything that can distract you from, uh, from finishing the race. Now we're talking about the spiritual race of your life. That can be the pursuit of money. Athletes pursue to win to get paid. You win in the Olympics, I think you get like a gold medal gets you like thirty, sixty thousand dollars or something like that. Like they, they want as many as possible because they get paid and then they get a sponsorship. We don't run to get paid. We pursue to win because our treasure is in heaven. By finishing the race, we do get paid. Our pay our pay is a little bit later, and then we get to throw it back at Jesus' feet. That's amazing. Uh, I've just got a few here. Obsession with family. People obsess over spouses and children. If you ever go to a PTA meeting at school, you will get to see people who have made their children their idols. It happens, and it's super annoying. We obsess over the one who has the ability to actually be our God. Uh, from talking to married couples that just didn't quite make it or extremely frustrated uh, in my uh, life, a lot of that has come from one spouse or the other expecting the other spouse to be their fulfillment in that they want them to be their God. Humans make bad gods. I imagine whenever me and Faith got married that she had this great picture. Man, if he's as good of a husband as he is at fooling everyone into thinking he's a good pianist, then I've got it made. And then after three days, she's like, what is this? Because humans make bad gods. We don't put our hope in something human. We put our hope in something bigger than that. 
Uh, I put on here excessive hobbies. Athletes do not carry their crochet needles with them on the track. Our hobbies should not interfere with our ability to do good. So listen, if you crochet, man, that's great. Make me a hat. I'm bald. It gets cold in the winter. If you have hobbies, everyone needs hobbies. I have hobbies. Uh, I tend to start one and then forget about it and then start another one and forget about it. Don't look in my garage. But the fact is, is that that's great. But whenever they become something that is an encumbrance, then it's a problem. I think down here, probably our biggest one would be folks will buy boats and then they'll kind of forget about church because, hey man, I've got this cool boat. I've got to use it. And then they, it kind of becomes their idol. It happens. It happens. And that's an encumbrance that keeps us from finishing the race. I didn't mean to rag on your boat, Kay. Wasting time. Athletes don't get the option to take a breather during a race. That comes after the race. Uh, just like we have to make the best use of our time for the kingdom, redeeming the time, uh, because we get a breather at the end. Honestly, sometimes it feels like we're going to choke. Let's just be honest here. It's just us here tonight. Sometimes this spiritual race feels like it's going to kill us, like our calves are going to explode and we are just going to die panting on the track. But listen, at the end of this race, we get a breather. And it honestly, it lasts for eternity. We make the best use of our time for the kingdom. An athlete gets to rest for a little bit after a race. We get to rest for an eternity which is amazing because I'm super tired. Coffee hasn't kicked in yet. The point is, is that a racer has trouble racing when he's encumbered. That, that's just the way it goes. So we have two ways of approaching this when we are encumbered. Bear each other's burdens. We're commanded to help each other out. There's some things that are on you. Some you may have put on there by yourself. Some may have just fell on your life because they were meant to. Let's bear each other's burden, and it makes both of our races a little bit easier. Also, cast your cares on Jesus, for he cares for you. He says his burden is light. So this may sound irreverent, but as you are running your race, when that stuff gets on your shoulders, flip it off to the sidelines to Jesus. Just, hey, hold this, hold this, hold this, hold this. Because he says to do it. The other thing that, that hinders us in this race is sin. Sin. Sin that easily entangles us. Let's be honest. It is incredibly easy to sin. Incredibly easy. Our flesh craves for sin. It yearns for sin. Look at the rampant sinning that is just embraced by modern culture. The, the battle cry of, if it's good for you, then do it. I promise you, it's not as good for you as you think it is. Because of the fall, our default state is sinfulness. Our flesh craves the pleasures of sin even when our minds understand the dangers. So sin at its heart is defined as this, disobedience to God. God made the game. He gets to make the rules. God defines sin. We've just perfected its use as humans. So sin entangles us. That is to say, it hinders us from racing. An athlete cannot run if a ninja jumps out and throws bolas at his legs. That's the two balls with a rope attached. An athlete cannot run if his shoes are tied together. An athlete cannot run if he's hogtied by a cowboy. If you are tied up, your ability to exert yourself physically is extremely hampered. Imagine just trying to run with your hands tied behind your back. You don't realize how much you need them things waving beside you. If you're playing with sin... Your ability to live out a truly spiritual life is extremely hampered. 
instead of dealing with the great blessings of spiritual fulfillment, you're dealing with one of two things. You're either going to be dealing with God's chastisement because God will lovingly chastise those who are his, or you may not be truly converted. Search yourself to see whether you be in the faith and make sure. Though we wrestle with the desires of our flesh, we are empowered to overcome temptation. God always provides a way out of temptation. So we're told to lay aside these hindrances as we run our spiritual race. So the word lay aside means to cast something off like a garment. Like, like when we get home from work, what is the first thing we do, man? Those shoes go flying. And that's what it's saying. Cast them off. That means we shed our hindrances and our sins like we're taking off a coat. And that is not always the easiest thing for us to do. We can be sitting inside sweating to death and we want to keep that coat on. That's because we are prideful beings and we tend to truly believe we can finish the race wearing stilettos when Nikes would have done a lot better for us. That's the way we are. So we are to lay aside both things that hinder us. First, our encumbrances, how our weights, how do we weigh the how how do we get rid of those? Because those aren't those aren't sins necessarily. That's just something that holds us back from our true potential. And I'm just going to give you a few a few ideas of what we can do. Better time management, uh, better self-control, bearing each other's burdens, and fully casting your care on Jesus and actually believing he's capable to handle it. A lot of people say, you know, Jesus, take the wheel, but they don't take their hands off of it. Man, that was a Carrie Underwood reference. I need more coffee. <laughs> This is getting out of hand. So get rid of our encumbrances. What about our sins? How do we cast off the entanglements of the sin? First and foremost is true bona fide repentance. You can't run a spiritual race if you're spiritually dead. The first thing you have to do to cast off sin is to get saved. That's, that's step one. Next off is a lifestyle characterized by repentance. So a, a Christian, I, I like this a saying I heard one time as a preacher said, how do I know that I repented? Because I'm still repenting. Actively fighting or fleeing sin. There's some darts of the wicked one, of Satan, that our shield of faith can quench. And then there's some sins like lust that the Bible says flee. Some of that stuff you just have to get away from. Engaging God in habitual prayer. Listen, I'm going to branch off from this. It's okay to have an established time to pray. So, so a lot of people that I've talked to say, I can't find time to pray. I don't know when to pray. I want it to be spontaneous because spontaneity means I mean it. Well, not necessarily. Spontaneity does not equate to heartfelt meaning. It's okay to establish a time to pray. Pray on your way to work. Pray. I like to pray in the shower. Faith thinks that, or, or not Faith, my friend Bradley, he thinks that that's weird because he's like, how do you talk to God when you're, you know, in your default state? And uh, that's how he made us. But uh, I like to talk to God in the shower. It's difficult when Oliver's in there with me. Because that guy just flips all over the place. Listen, it's okay to write out prayers. To get you a pen and paper, get your phone and, and type it out on there. Write out a prayer. There are all kinds of prayers you can read from the Puritans and men uh, from, from throughout the ages where their prayers are beautiful. Look at some of the prayers that are written out in your Bible. Write a prayer, man. It's kind of like writing a poem. It's pretty cool. Not everybody's are good, but it's going to be good for you. And then next of all, it's okay to confess daily. You don't have to carry that guilt. Whenever you biff it and you mess up and you realize, oh man, I totally just messed that up. Tell God about it. He already knows. 
He watched you do it. He doesn't care about you less. It's not like I've done some egregious act and now God regrets saving me. Listen, Christian, if you take nothing else from this, no, God doesn't regret saving you. He doesn't look at you and say, well, they biffed it. What did I do with them? No, he doesn't do that. He does not regret it because he loves you. Your sin's paid for. You just need your feet washed. Don't let confession, also, don't let confession consume you into defeat. Don't always be walking around in defeat because, man, I wish I could do better for God. I wish I could do better for God. I keep messing up. I keep messing up. This besetting sin is destroying me. No, 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 no. That's what Satan wants you to do. He wants you to focus on that. Don't just focus on that. Tell God about it and then leave it there and let him deal with it. Hey, God, this one got me again. I'm sorry. Help. That's free. It's okay to sacrifice time for a conversation with God because ultimately he sacrificed much more of his time for us. Mm-hmm. So find a little bit of time for him. I'm sure we all do. Y'all are, y'all are all way better at this than me. Y'all could have taught this lesson. I could be a Waffle House right now. <laughs> the, but I will tell you this, that we have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. We are fully armored mm-hmm. and we're ready to take on the evil one. But I'll also give you this warning. The more that you wage war on sin, the harder it will push back. Yet we still, we must lay it aside if we're going to finish the spiritual race. Cast it off like a garment. Cast it off like that shirt I wore three weeks ago that's still in my floor. So what is our motivation to run this race as pertains to this point? One, the example set before us the great cloud of witnesses, we can be motivated when we get down and don't want to finish this race by looking at the ones who've done it before us in Hebrews chapter 11. They made it. They did it. They made it through. Were they perfect people? No, they were not. Abraham was a terrible father to Isaac. Sent him away. Not a good dad. Jacob, terrible person all around. Rahab's in there, man. She had a terrible profession. There are some people in there. It lists like some judges, man. Samson made it in there. The Bible only records him ever praying once. Samson was not a role model. Jephthah uh, sacrifices his own daughter because he makes a stupid covenant. I mean, these guys are not perfect, but they are examples of faith in making it through. And don't stare at their perfections and think, these guys are idiots. Look at their perfections and see yourself in them and say, I'm not perfect. And man, God puts up with me too. Take heart from it. We can learn from the examples of them. We can learn from the examples of those that have gone before us. We can look at the Bible, look at other examples there. We can look into church history. If you've never read the Fox's Book of Martyrs, I highly recommend it. A little gruesome, but it is nice to see that there are people that are willing to shed blood for the faith Uh, outside the pages of scripture. And also, let's bring it even into a modern context. Let's look at our mentors. We can look at people like uh, like Pastor Kevin. We can look at people like JB. Don't look at JB. But we can look at them and we can see those mentors and we can see that they're actual people that struggle with actual problems that are trying to live actual Christian lives. And we can take great comfort in knowing that we are not alone. Not only that, We can have motivation in our own abilities. Now, listen, before I get fired, I'm not saying our ability to gain or maintain salvation. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying we can look at ourselves and pat ourselves on the back about our works and things that we've done to attain salvation because that's foolishness. We know that's not the way it is. But look, we're told to lay aside our encumbrances. That denotes activity on our part. When we successfully war against sin, I think of probably the biggest thing that's facing young men today is probably the, uh, the the relentless onslaught of pornography and its availability. I mean, snap, I'll be on my phone Googling random historical junk and man, it just pops up. Like it is impossible to avoid. 
Whenever a, whenever a, a young man manages to, to avoid that, man, rejoice in that. Thank God for that. Hey, man, I managed to flee from that. Thank you, God. Be comforted by that. Be motivated by that. The book of James is the clearest example of works that prove Christianity. We can fall into the pit of leaning so far onto God's sovereignty that we neglect our own behavior. I can do this. Where I'll say things like, God's running the show, so why should I do anything? Or maybe you've heard people say, God knows my need, why should I pray? God will save whoever he wants to, so why should we evangelize? Well, I'll tell you why. Because God told you to. Sure, God is sovereign over all, but God also said, pray without ceasing. God just or God is the means. God is the way to the means. God says to do it, so do it. We're, we're slaves. That's what we have to do. God decrees what passes, but he also decrees the means by which it passes. So if we're told to run a race, that means God gives us the ability to, to run the race. That also means we have to train for it. When God told Joshua that he would fight with the Israelites to conquer Canaan in the book of Joshua, what did Joshua do? He trained his armies. He used sound battle tactics. He did some cool stuff. He was the first recorded guy to use the bait and switch method. But he was also sensitive to what God told him to do. The moral of the story is Joshua didn't sit back lazily. So just like him, we can be confident that when we do work for the master, he will give us the ability to do said work. And we can take confidence in that. I'll tell you what, we'll go through one more thing. Yeah, we, can, we can probably finish up. It's only 7.30. We've got you know, two, three hours till bedtime. Not only that, let's look to Jesus as an example. This is point number two. Look to Jesus as an example. So whenever you get to verse number two, the author of Hebrews has changed focus. Verse number one speaks of our responsibility to cast off this stuff. Verse number two begins to speak of Jesus. Jesus is the greatest example we can look to for inspiration on how to run our spiritual race. First it says, fix our eyes on Jesus. So an athlete is told the idiom, keep your eye on the prize. That is to say, keep in mind what you're aiming to achieve. If you're wanting to push for a gold medal, you have to train a little bit harder than if you wanted a bronze. Not LeBron, but a bronze medal. I don't think anybody wants LeBron. We watched Space Jam the other night. That's why I bring that up. It was terrible. Don't watch it. Don't watch it. Zero out of ten. If we keep our intentions on the uplifting and worshiping of Jesus, we might just race a little bit harder and a little better. The Bible says, whatsoever you do, do it in the name of Jesus. I said one time, whenever you're out mowing and you hit a rock and it flies into your shin, if you, uh, are, if you have said as you walked out there, I'm going to mow in the name of Jesus, you're less likely to drop a word Jesus doesn't like. I said less likely, not certainly. But it's hard to do some things when you're always thinking about him. So, so, so the Bible talks about having a mind saturated with Christ. Think upon the good things. Think on good things. And the fact is, is that whenever you're genuinely thinking about Christ, there's other things that you're just not going to do. It's going to be harder for sin to get a foothold on you when you're thinking about him. That's just the way that it is. And our life is a struggle against sin. We know that Jesus is our final and true fulfillment. At the end of the race, when our spiritual journey is complete, we get to see him face to face. Amen. And I'll tell you, as I get older and see more nonsense in the world, and I've also noticed that as you get older, your tolerance for nonsense starts getting less too. I'm ready to see him. 
and I'm just in my 30s. So fixing your eyes on Jesus not only keeps your eye on the prize, but it also invokes the imagery of a cherished person that you're racing towards. So think about this. Think of the father in the prodigal son story as as he's racing towards his son that's coming back. Think about all those YouTube videos of a child's reaction whenever their father is returning home from Afghanistan after years of a tour. I think of when this guy rear-ended me at Germantown Road and I called Faith and I was like, hey, I've been in a wreck. She starts freaking out over the phone. In the middle of that, I'm like, hey, I gotta go. I gotta talk to the cop. So left her just hanging. Learning experience. Don't do that. <laughs> and uh, whenever I got home, Faith ran out and hugged me. And then whenever she realized I wasn't hurt, then she got mad at me. But how much should it motivate us to know that when the race is done, we see Jesus face to face? We get to meet the guy that we've been talking to. Fixing our eyes on Jesus shows an example of what to strive for. We can look at one who is our mentor. We can follow his example because he set the perfect example for us. If we're disgusted by what our lives look like, let's look at Jesus's and just try to emulate it. Emulation is the best form of flattery. Let's let's flatter. So Jesus holds two titles in this verse. The first one is the author. The second one is the perfecter. I think King James says author and finisher. Author, the Greek word, it means founder. Christianity is literally named after Christ. The Christian walk is literally all about Christ. Without the arrival of Jesus, the Old Testament law can't be fulfilled, and we're still separated into Jew and Gentile. That barrier's still there. We need a temple. Or they need a temple. We're SOL, man. Without his death, all of Christianity is vain, and our religious practices and deeds are useless. We're just cultists. Jesus is called the first fruits, the Bible says, the preeminent one. He was there when the Old Testament was written. He was there when the New Testament was written. He is the complete author of the one true faith. The, the one, I use the NASB Bible, the word says perfecter. The King James actually wins this one oh, on this one here. The Greek word literally means finisher. Finisher. Jesus is the founder, the beginner. Jesus is the finisher. Our faith begins with Jesus. He's right there in in Genesis 1. John 1 talks about it. Our faith ends with Jesus. He's right there at the end of Revelation. Not only did Jesus originate the Christian faith, he's the consummate ending of it. When time ends and the earth flees away and there's nothing but judgment left before the new heaven and new earth, guess who's there? Jesus is there. Normally, death is the end of a person's existence, at least as we know it on on the face of this earth from a physical standpoint. But death not only bowed down to the king of kings, but it couldn't overpower him because Jesus is the source of life. Because death was not the finish, the resurrection is the crux of Christianity. Death wasn't the finish for Jesus. Death is not the finish for us. We may cross that finish line, but after that we get to go to the award ceremony. So Jesus is the founder. Jesus is the finisher. One could even go so far as to say he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end So what's our motivation as relates to this point? We're going super fast now. This is great. The rest of verse 2 details it for us. Jesus is our perfect example. He endured the cross. That is, he endured immense pain, immense suffering, the immense amount of sin that was laid upon him. And think about it, all the weight of that sin on there, and it didn't rip the nails out of his hands. Blows my mind. Imminent embarrassment. He was naked up there. Man, and ultimately he endured death. Says he also despised the shame. No one wants to go through that. He prayed, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. But it was God's will, so he did it. 
That's okay. Listen, if there's times where you don't want to do what God wants you to do, that's fine. Tell him. I told him I didn't want to come to Memorial and play piano. But you know what I did? I did it. And I'm glad I did. Just like Jesus, as it'll say in the next verse, for the joy set before him, he was glad he did it. Lastly, he sets down at the right hand of God because his work is completed. He was rewarded for the work he did. So how could Jesus do all this? Like I said, the joy set before him. Jesus' eyes were on the end game. He knew the goal and he knew what would have to be accomplished when he succeeded. So that is Jesus succeeds, makes it back to heaven while accomplishing redemption for all believers of all time. It wasn't joy as he suffered. Just like for us, it's not joy when we're suffering. It's not joy when we're broke. It's not joy when we're sick. It's not joy when people are just pushing against us. But it is complete joy for the eternity afterward. Lastly, verse number three. I want to talk about powering through the weariness. Verse three gives us our last command in relation to running our spiritual race. We must consider Jesus and his endurance. Remember, these are motivations for us to endure, to hold out till the end. Jesus faced hostility by sinners against himself. This extends beyond the, just the crucifixion. We know during the crucifixion narrative that, that he faced lashings, he faced mockings, they, they ripped out his beard, they struck him, they slapped him, they punched him. Uh, honestly, the worst one, I think, I don't like the forced march where they, they threw that cross on him and made him carry it after doing all this mess. They pierced him, the, the crown of thorns going into his head. Man, can you imagine how bad that would hurt? Like we get a splinter and cry about it. Imagine that, the, the robe ripping. Uh, that one sounds relatively mild compared to these others, but I want to imagine this. Jesus is ripped up, scabbed up. The Bible says you can't tell he's human. He's all ripped up, nothing but open source. They put a purple robe around him for a couple hours. And what happens? That robe starts sticking to those sores. You want to know what happens when they pull that robe off? Every wound that that robe touches rips back open. Jesus is cut and striped again. And then, of course, the shame of nakedness. But that's not all the hostility that he faced. In, 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 uh, in his life, he faced opposition from re religious elites. Man, they should have been the one flocking to him. Tell us the words of God. And they didn't. They ultimately killed him. Pharisees and Sadducees. He faced opposition from his own hometown. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if, uh, if you got famous and you came back to town and, and we just decided, no, we don't want nothing to do with you. You'd be destroyed. He had opposition from places where he healed. I think of the Gadarenes where he heals the, the man that's out in by the tombs and, and breaking chains and stuff, man. And, and he Jesus heals him and the Gadarenes come out and say, get out of here. We don't want no part of this. He faces unbelief from the ones he healed. I think of the ten lepers where only one of them comes back and says thanks. And the rest just take their blessing and go. People only cared about what he could do, not who he was. And listen, if they did that for Jesus, they're definitely going to do that for us. Care about what we can do, not about who we are. In fact, I mean, that sounds like the very nature of employment. He still faced hostility even in death. So his hostility didn't even end after death. They stationed soldiers at his tomb that had to make up a lie when he resurrected. And their lie was kind of stupid. Well, you know, while, while we were asleep, his disciples came and stole him away. How would you know you were asleep? What a terrible lie. Like, why not say they overpowered us or something? At least then it's believable. Now, while we were sleeping, we, we totally caught them. <laughs> Idiots. But anyway, and the thing is, is that Jesus still faces hostility 
to this day. Right. Try to preach Jesus in China. Try to preach Jesus on the street corner. I remember hearing somebody talk about how they uh, they had a family member who was trying to preach in front of the courthouse in uh, Chatsworth and somebody shot at him out of a car. That's Chatsworth, man. Chatsworth. People still try to claim Jesus never existed. Of course, no real historian is going to agree with that. There, there's too many sources. But people still doubt his divinity. People tend to say that they like his teaching. I think if they actually read his teaching, they probably wouldn't like it so much. But they don't like Jesus' requirements. Hey, if you don't hate your father and mother... You're not worthy to follow after me. I'm more important than they are. That's tough teaching. That's tough stuff. We must keep all of this in mind because we're going to face the same thing. Persecution, though, has never stopped the church. In fact, I'm here to say I feel like if I told Kay she couldn't do something, she's going to get out there and do it. Faith, you can't, or uh, Kay, you can't jump in the car and run and get us a sack full of crystals real fast. <laughs> but and the thing is is that with persecution it has lessened throughout history in areas but it's never ceased it's never ceased persecution since this book was written has never 100% fully stopped we will be hated we will be mocked Maybe not us, maybe us will be killed for our faith. We, we tend to think that that happens more off in other countries. It happens here too. What this verse says in verse number three is to consider what he went through for us. What we go through is nothing compared to that. We don't have to bear the weight of every single sin and still keep our body hanging on a cross. We can look to Jesus and see that no matter what we go through, one, he understands because he's been faced with it and he's been faced with temptations before. Man, Satan was tempting him whenever he was 40 days fasting in the wilderness, man. I'm easy to tempt when I've skipped one meal. Yeah. Hence the crystals. <laughs> Two... Jesus has gone through much worse. Anything we can go through. He's gone through much worse. And guess what he did? He made it. He made it. Our race is nowhere near as tough as his. And he did it. So what does our motivation look like as related to this point? We look at the example of Jesus' resilience. He made it through. People were not good to him. They were outright awful to him. I mean, can you imagine how exhausting it would be if you're trying to give people the words of life and you're trying to nourish their souls and all they want is for you to heal their bodies? That would be like if the world, if, if the world was all your kids. Imagine having a billion kids coming up to you saying, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this. Man, I'd lose my mind. I'd move to Mars. Jumping on that ship with... Jeff Bezos. Jesus died owning nothing. He had nothing. He didn't even have a grave. He had to borrow that. I mean, he didn't need it for long. It but none of them believe it. Yeah, yeah, he just used it for the weekend. <laughs> Vacation house. Yet he made it through and he received the joy that he was expecting. He didn't even get downhearted and lose faith. He expected it. We can look to his example and we can see that like him, we will make it through. The ending of the story for the Christian is a happy ending. We're not a Greek tragedy. When we consider that Jesus up, ended up in a much better place than he was at here on this earth, we will not grow weary. We will not lose heart. And that's what verse 3 says. Don't lose heart. An athlete, when competing in a race won't give up halfway through the race. The saying is, 
power through the pain. I say persevere through the weariness. Makes you sound smarter. Makes you sound real smart. I know that we get tired. I know that we grow weary. Our muscles start to ache. I feel like I'm that perpetually. But we have a few ways of refreshment. Gathering together. That is a great motivator. Taking time for prayer. We talked about that earlier. Surrounding ourselves with people that are beneficial to our spiritual lives. There's a lot of times where we try to force relationships with people that, that really don't bring us any kind of joy at all and really can care less about us. Man, you know, just distance yourself from that. Be around people that are beneficial to your spiritual life. Meditate on God's Word. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Just like a runner who grabs a cup of water to get refreshed in a race, God has not left us to do this by our own means alone. A true athlete does not give up during the big race. They finish no matter the pain. We made it to the conclusion. Yay! I'm only half tired. The coffee's kicking in. Now we can do this again. <laughs> There's another word that the Bible uses in relation to endurance, and that word is overcome. Overcoming. Jesus writes to the churches in Revelation, and he tells them the benefits of the ones who overcome. I won't give you all this. All that he tells them. I'll let y'all go look at it. Revelation 2 and 3. But the ones that overcome, man, they get it good. They get it good. So Christian, if you're getting discouraged and you're ready to give up on your spiritual race, just remember Philippians 1, 6. He that began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. If you're truly saved, you will endure. You will overcome don't lose heart. Look to Jesus. He is a great help for the exhausted soul. Amen.